Also, if you look at, you know, supports uh, by uh, Republicans, for instance, their support for Ukraine, I think, was in the order of about 94% back in, you know, uh, February, March. Uh, it's now nearly 50-50. Someone has been doing a lot of work to, you know, uh, uh, shift that needle. And that does change things. That does change uh, uh, how easy it is for the United States to you know, support Russia. And so, yes, their information operations don't necessarily look the same, you know, in, in the sort of like Twitter-driven NAFO, whatever, or you know, uh, uh, TikTok memes, uh, and so on. And I don't, I don't mean to say that, you know, pejoratively. Ukraine does uh, a, a lot of work bigger than that, but just because it's not super obvious doesn't mean that it's not happening, you know, uh, behind the scenes. I'm Natalie Orpet, executive editor of Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast. November 16th, 2022. Matt Tate is a cybersecurity expert who has worked both in the private sector and for the British government at GCHQ, the UK's intelligence, security, and cyber agency. He's also a lawfare contributor. Like a lot of us, Tate has spent the last several months thinking about Ukraine. And my colleague, Lawfare's editor-in-chief Benjamin Wittes, had cybersecurity questions for him. Most importantly, why is the Ukrainian internet still functioning? Why have the Russians been so ineffective in the cyber arena? But they talked about a wide range of other things, too. Is U.S. support for Ukraine threatened with the Republicans in control of the House? And what is the Biden administration going to do about Section 702, which is scheduled to expire at the end of next year? It's the Lawfare Podcast, November 16th, 2022. Matt Tate on cybersecurity in Ukraine. So, Matt, I want to start with the question of why the internet is still on in Ukraine. The Russians seem (laughs) more than capable of blowing up civilian infrastructure. It takes a lot of civilian infrastructure to run an internet. And yet when I email or, you know, WhatsApp with my uh, friends in Kiev, everything seems okay. I mean, some of them don't have lights on, they can't charge their phones, but their internet works. And so I just, why is this happening? (laughs) No, it's it's a great question. And uh, before the war began, uh, one of the, the big expectations for the, the beginning period of the war was that communications infrastructure would be specifically targeted by the Russian Federation in order to disrupt uh, our government-to-government communications, uh, our defense communications, as well as you know civilian communications uh, within the country and between the country and sort of uh, the international community, especially for you know uh, keeping keeping a lid on the information about what was going on. And we all really expected that that was going to happen at the very beginning of the war, and it didn't happen. And there's been lots and lots of different theories as to why. So uh, some of the, the early theories was that they expected to win in Ukraine so quickly that it would be to their advantage uh, for communications to be available so that uh, everybody in Ukraine would see how quickly their, their country was losing. It would be demoralizing, you know, uh, uh, very quickly uh, everyone would, would come in line. Uh, that clearly, you know, m- maybe that makes sense in the first couple of days of the war. It clearly doesn't make sense, you know, a couple of weeks later. More recently, some theories have been emerging that, you know, perhaps they haven't been targeting communications infrastructure because they're, they're low on precision guided munitions, uh, are being able to fire, you know, cruise missiles, you know, uh, very long range deep into to Ukraine is expensive for, for the Russian military. And perhaps they're, they're, they're deciding that they don't need to, especially if they can target, uh, other things, you know, in particular, uh, power stations, right? You know, if you, uh, disable the the power stations, then it, you know uh, as the communications infrastructure is sort of collaterally hit. You know it it, it turns off too, uh, and so places that don't have power rapidly, you know, don't have communications either. Uh, another theory, of course, is that you know Russian forces have been making use of you know uh, uh, communications infrastructure too, and they they don't want to disable it. But that makes sense, you know, towards the front lines. It doesn't make particular sense, you know, uh, uh, deep into to Ukraine where their forces are. So yeah, there's there's not particularly good answers to that. There's lots of different working theories. Uh, none of them I'm particularly happy with. I'm curious 
if you were the commander of Russian forces and wanted to take out the Ukrainian internet, I mean, I understand, you know, people always say you, you, you can't destroy the internet, the electrons will f- find a path, you know, and I understand that in a, in a place like the United States where, you know, which is, or South Korea or something, which is really densely wired, but how true is it of a place like Ukraine? No, well, and it, it, even in places like the United States, like the, the internet is, is, it depends what you mean by internet, right? You know, if you're talking about like the individual websites, yes, it's very decentralized. It's very difficult to sort of, you know, uh, uh, take all of those different websites down at the same time because, you know, some are in, you know, uh, one building and some is in a different building, right? But when we're talking about sort of like the backbone connection, the, the thing that people are actually using to connect to the internet, the communications infrastructure itself, uh, that's, you know, first of all, enormous bandwidth. And second of all, because it's such enormous bandwidth, runs inside, you know, uh, very, very large uh, uh, buildings, essentially, uh, uh, managing those uh, that infrastructure. So, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the internet exchange points themselves, which, you know, uh, uh, connect out, you know, uh, so, 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 so when you, you or I use a, a laptop or a phone in order to connect to the internet, what we're actually doing is we're connecting to a telecommunications provider. They aggregate a lot of communications that happen there out through massive, massive uh, internet exchanges, which then go out to, you know, either undersea cables or, you know, out through to, you know, neighboring countries at, you know, massive, massive sort of, uh, scale. And actually targeting those things is not super difficult, you know, if you're a, a competent military, because, you know, first of all, it's not a secret where these things are. And second of all, it's very, very obvious from, you know, uh, uh satellite, uh, imagery and from, you know, basic understanding of how these types of networks are run that so you can target them. You can, you can, you know, functionally destroy them. Uh, where it gets a little bit more complicated, of course, is that, you know, not all internet goes, you know, in, in exactly the same way. You know, some people uh, access the internet through satellite phones, for instance. That's sort of routed in a different way. You know, uh, uh, perhaps there's good reasons why Russia wouldn't want to destroy the satellites involved, you know, for, for other reasons. Um, so disabling that type of communications is a little bit different. But, you know, the, the core civilian infrastructure, like if Russia really wanted to destroy it, it's difficult to understand why they haven't. And one possibility is not that they, you know, don't know where it is or that they don't know what you just described, right? I mean, people have been talking about all kinds of levels of Russian uh, military incompetence over the last few months, but these are big buildings that are, whose locations are not secret and everybody knows what they're for. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, and there's also not all that many of them, right? You know, it's, it's, it's you know, not one or two, like uh, a Kiev region, uh, uh, last I checked, had about 13 of them, five of which, you know, large interconnections, um, which is, you know, well within, you know, what a, a military can destroy if it, if it particularly is interested in doing it. And it, it seems to me like the, the, the reason why it, it continues to exist is because for whatever reason, they haven't prioritized destroying it. At least in, in, you know, places like Kiev, it gets more complicated as you get out to, you know, uh, uh, cities further east where there's much more heavy infrastructure damage. And even in those cases, it's often a little bit difficult to pass out, you know, are they destroying the civilian communications infrastructure on purpose or are they destroying it collaterally because they're destroying so much infrastructure? Is it, you know, being disabled because they're targeting, you know, uh, uh, power infrastructure and with, you know, much less access to good quality information coming out of those sources, it can get much more, more complicated. But certainly in places like Kiev, it, it looks like they haven't been targeting any of the communications infrastructure, at least yet, other than collaterally through uh, a destroying power infrastructure. All right. So one possible reason for this is that they still think they're going to capture it all, which, you know, it, to me is a little bit belied by the way they handled Mariupol, which was to... Uh, level it and wipe it from the face of the earth and then capture it. Uh, So like, I think that was a sort of more plausible theory toward the beginning of the war when, you know, you could say, all right, well, Kiev is the, or, uh, you know, the mythical original seat of the Rus. It's a important uh, place in, in, uh, Russia's conception of its history, 
maybe they don't want to destroy it. Um, but they're being quite active about destroying things in Kiev. So this does not seem to me like a plausible explanation. Is there more to be said for it than than I'm giving it credit for after the first sort of three months of the war when when it becomes clear that this is not going to be a cakewalk into into Kiev? Yeah, so I, I think there's, you know, where, uh, multiple different stages that have, have taken place in this war. Like, I, I think the, the, the first couple of days, there was, you know, an expectation in, in Russian military leadership that this was going to be a relatively uh, a short and simple war. And, you know, they're, they're going to uh, walk into Kiev and, and, you know, everything will be fine. You know, we, we have lots of evidence of that, not least the, uh, uh, the style of the invasion, but also, you know, little things like, you know, se- several of the... Uh, uh, Russians that were uh, captured at the beginning of the the war had access to, you know, uh, had come into the country with, you know, uh, 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 their military parade clothes, right? You know, they they were expecting a, 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 a an easy war where they would then be able to, you know, parade through the streets of Kiev as, you know, the the latest city owned by the Russian Federation, right? Um, but that makes sense, you know, the the beginning of the war, like clearly it was a, a wrong view, but like, you know, that was their view. After Kerch, after the, the attack on the Kerch Bridge, I think it starts to become really very difficult to, you know, see that in the same sort of light. You know, uh, uh, if you remember the, the attack on the, the Kerch Bridge by uh, uh, Ukraine over the weekend, uh, Russia planned and then executed a, a massive series of uh, uh, long range strikes against Kiev and other cities. And the Kerch Bridge, for those who uh, don't know the name, is the bridge that Putin built connecting the Crimean Peninsula to Russia. It's very symbolically important in a positive sense for the Russians and in a uh, powerfully negative sense for the Ukrainians. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's symbolically very important. It's also militarily very important. It, it has a, a, a one of the, the big railways uh, sort of connecting a lot of Russia's supply lines in, in sort of the southern offensive out through to mainland Russia. So it, it's, it's logistically very important as well as uh, being symbolically very important. But yeah, um, after uh, uh, Ukraine uh, uh, triggered this explosion on, on the bridge and, and did substantial damage to it, that happened, if I remember correctly, on, on a Friday. On the, the following Monday, uh, Russia responds with about 80 uh, uh, long range missile strikes uh, in and around uh, major cities in Ukraine, including Kiev. Uh, and they, they were targeting, uh, amongst other things, you know, cultural sites. So, you know, uh, things like the, the Klitschko Bridge is a bridge of cultural significance. You know, it's a, a pedestrian footbridge in, in Kiev. Uh, there was, uh, attacks that hit, uh, uh, right next to, you know, one of the central parks, right next to, you know, one of the, the uh, uh, universities. Um, so it, it becomes much harder in, in sort of light of, of that response. To start thinking, you know, like maybe they're leaving the communications infrastructure up because, you know, they don't want to do too much damage because they're trying to capture it uh, when they're at the same time attacking cultural sites. All right. So one of the things that you hear a lot in the United States, which is uh, self-congratulatory with respect to U.S. industry and particularly with respect to Elon Musk, is that the explanation for the resilience of the Ukrainian internet is U.S. tech companies and that, you know, Silicon Valley covertly invaded Ukraine shortly before the Russians did overtly, and they have been secretly or not so secretly keeping the internet up. How much validity does this theory have? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very ugly thing that, you know, uh, uh, y- y- Ukrainians in Ukraine are, are suffering, you know, uh, uh, enormous costs and, and, and sort of involved in sort of the, the manual fixing of, you know, everything and the installation of everything. There's very, very few Westerners there. I mean, there, there's certainly some, but very few that are you know, uh, uh, actively, you know, uh, going into the danger zone and actually repairing all of this stuff. It's very ugly when uh, U.S. firms and, and you know, uh, uh, people overseas sort of try and overtly take credit for, you know, uh, uh, what's often the, the bravery and, and, and diligence of, of Ukrainians doing difficult work. Um, but it, it's certainly the case that, you know, Ukraine has been massively supported by uh, uh, firms out in, in the United States, out in Europe as well. 
when it comes to things like cybersecurity, when it comes to things like uh, supply of things like servers being, you know, shipped in, uh, when it comes to things like, you know, satellite phones, it's, it's self-evidently the case. Uh, you know, a, a Starlink is not the only satellite phone uh, uh, in use in Ukraine, but, you know, Starlink uh, devices are, are manufactured, developed in, in the United States. They've been, you know, uh, a very important logistically for uh, uh, Ukraine's armed forces. Um, when it comes to, you know, repairing the internet infrastructure itself specifically, uh, a lot of that is just that it hasn't been attacked. In the event that it was attacked, then the, the repairs, I think, would, would depend very, very heavily on, you know, uh, uh, imports of equipment when it comes to sort of stuff below the internet exchange level, when it comes to things like, you know, uh, um, uh, mobile phone mass when it comes to you know things like repairing buildings and and sort of uh, power infrastructure a lot of that has relied quite heavily on imports uh you know often donated from the west generally being imported into ukraine so that it can be installed by ukrainian engineers and they've done enormous you know heroic work managing to actually install that at speed in order to limit the 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 downtime that their customers uh within ukraine are, are, are facing it gets much more difficult when it comes to, you know, massive scale uh, attacks has happened recently in, in Kiev, where they're currently now having to experience rolling blackouts, and, and that's going to take a bit longer to repair. But the, the bulk of the work and certainly the dangerous work is being done by Ukrainians. All right. So finally, you refer to uh, Russian attacks on power infrastructure that effectively collaterally hit not because it destroys the routing systems and the server farms, but because they require electricity like everything else. And if you take down uh, the power grid and have rolling blackouts, that's going to you know, affect connectivity along with other things. That said, that's a much blunter instrument than simply taking out the pipes. And so is it fair to say that there's a, at this stage, we're, you know, nine months into a war, uh, there is a Ukrainian internet because for some indiscernible reason, Russia wants there to be? Uh, Not necessarily that Russia wants there to be, but that they don't want there not to be enough, perhaps. I, I can't think of a good reason why if they particularly wanted to destroy you know, the, the civilian internet infrastructure inside Ukraine that they, they would be unable to, other than the fact that it would be very expensive on, you know, their, their long range, uh, uh, missiles and, and perhaps that they don't want to do that knowing that, you know, Ukraine can, uh, uh repair that inf- internet infrastructure through supplies out to, uh, the West, but those precision guided munitions cannot be easily replaced, uh, for the Russian Federation and perhaps they want to keep them for, you know, uh, uh apartment they would- buildings. Well, what, what, what they would perceive as, as more strategic objectives, you know, uh, uh, obviously where, when, when they do that, they often misfire and, and sort of destroy apartment buildings. When it comes to, you know, the, the indiscriminate civilian damage, they're, they're usually not using precision munitions for that. It's usually their, their non-precision munitions, unfortunately, and they have lots of those and they're using that at a considerable scale. All right. So... I don't want to give the Russians strategic advice, but I do think one of the interesting things, and it it suggests to me that they they really don't understand how badly they're being beaten in the information space, that, you know, Zelensky's means of communication with the outside world is, for a while, was YouTube videos, right? Uh, Was... Zoom conferences was all these internet based things. The, the whole NAFO movement, which how, however you describe what that is, the information space is one of the areas in which the Ukrainians have really just crushed the Russians. And so I'm, I'm curious whether you read this as sort of strategic blindness on the Russian side as to how badly they are being outperformed in in sort of extra external communications? Yeah, that's a great question. One thing I would say is that it's, it's from our sort of vantage point in, in the West, it's very easy to sort of see 
the extent to which Ukrainian communications are certainly foremost. Uh, uh, Ukrainian narratives uh, and sort of support for Ukraine tends to, you know, uh, uh, be dramatically louder than, you know, uh, Russian tankies and, you know, uh, pro-Russian accounts. That's not quite as true if you go a little bit outside of, you know, the West. There, there's actually the, the Russian inf- information operations that are, are taking place in the global south, uh, that are taking place in places like, you know, India and Brazil and Africa do seem to be doing pretty well. There's a lot of sort of a, a misunderstanding as to, you know, the, the origins of the conflict, as to, you know, who the participants in the conflict are, as to, you know, uh, uh, whose side uh, morally deserves uh, uh, support or, 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 you know, what the, the threats of, of continuing that support are, um, are quite different within the West and as you start to, you know, head out towards, you know, uh, uh, non-Western countries, uh, which I, I think is quite troubling. You know, things like NAFO play, you know, very well, I think, inside the United States. I, I'm not sure they play at all well in places like India or China. Fair, fair enough. But, I, I you know, if you think of it from the point of view of military strategy and you say, well, the United States and Western Europe and, and Eastern Europe have been the principal supporters of the Ukrainians in this conflict and the Ukrainian information operations, and I mean that not in a pejorative sense, but just in the sense of communications and public diplomacy have been superb and they have all been internet based. And so even if you say, well, our information operations are working pretty well in, in the grain buying countries of Africa and, and India and China, you'd still say, well, why do we want to leave this communications channel with an an American public that actually seems to care about this issue has bottom lips pits of money to appropriate <laughs> uh, to the, the issue. And by the way, with citizens in the UK who's, who have seemed to have required that successive prime ministers be pretty hard line about this, you know, like, like it does seem like a major strategic oversight on the part of the Russians. Right. So, it's, it's a little bit difficult because I think they have a, a, a broader understanding of information operations. So they, they sort of start from the strategic objective uh, rather than necessarily from the domain. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if, if I was in the Russian government, the thing that I would be looking at is I, I want to cut off Western support to Ukraine, uh, which would mean, you know, looking around the world and saying, who are the, the biggest people supporting Ukraine right now? That's the, the United States. It's countries like, you know, uh, uh, Poland and Germany and the United Kingdom, right? You know, there's a, a functionally like if you can get, you know, any of those, but particularly the United States to cut off support, uh, then, you know, Ukraine will be looking at a, a, a much, much, much worse uh, medium to long term picture. And what they're really targeting with their information operations is really the, the sort of the, the decision makers and not so much the, the public at large. And what I mean by that is if you start sort of taking a step back and you, you, you look at, you know, uh, a, a senior decision maker uh, sentiment around, you know, uh, support to Ukraine in Germany, for instance, uh, uh, there's a lot of, you know, real caution about, you know, the extent that we should be supporting uh, uh, Ukraine, what equipment we should be supporting them with, you know, how to minimize that kind of uh, uh, support rather than necessarily to maximize it. In the United States, there's a lot of elite decision maker uh, caution that sort of comes about from uh, a worry that, you know, perhaps uh, supporting Ukraine too much is going to cause, you know, uh, a spillover into, you know, nuclear escalation or, or, or what that's going to look like. Uh, also, if you look at, you know, support uh, by uh, Republicans, for instance, their support for Ukraine, I think, was in the order of about 94% back in, you know, uh, February, March. Uh, it's now nearly 50-50. Someone has been doing a lot of work to, you know, uh, uh, shift that needle. And that does change things. That does change uh, uh, how easy it is for the United States to, you know, support Russia. And so, yes, their information operations don't necessarily look the same, you know, in, in the sort of like Twitter-driven NAFO, whatever, or, you know, uh, uh, TikTok memes uh, and so on. And, and I don't I don't mean to say that, you know, pejoratively, Ukraine does. Uh, a, a lot of work bigger than that. But just because it's not super obvious doesn't mean that it's not happening 
you know, uh, behind the scenes or that it's not effective. And that is quite troubling. Right. So I don't begrudge the Russians the effectiveness of their own information operations. I'm just bewildered that they allow, given that they could really make an impact on this connectivity that, that the Ukrainians are relying on quite diversely, it strikes me as a major strategic oversight for them to leave that channel open, particularly given how ineffectively they're using their long-range precision-guided missiles to begin with. I think that's fair. Um, it, one, one thing to also bear in mind is that a lot of the, the information operations that, that you know, sort of pro, pro-Ukrainian uh, discussion, you know, meme generation, you know, a, a, a lot of that kind of stuff, you have to be a little bit careful. A lot of that's not actually being generated in Ukraine. Uh, often it's being generated by Ukrainians, uh, but a lot of them are, are not in Ukraine, you know, especially sort of the, the refugee community and sort of the, the wider community of, of Ukrainians not necessarily in Ukraine itself. Sure, but the Ukrainian but the Ukrainian government's internet operations are extremely sophisticated. Everything from the daily Zelensky YouTube speech. Oh, sure, to... but that but th- th- disabling that would be a, a very very different challenge to you know uh, uh, if if you want to make it very difficult for you know people in downtown Kiev to be able to access Twitter, like that that's reasonably easy to do. If you want to prevent uh, uh, Zelensky from you know doing his uh, uh, daily YouTube videos, that would be genuinely quite difficult for for the Russian government because you know Zelensky has access to you know communications that are not based on. Uh, uh, using the the traditional internet exchanges, he has right, but you could make it much more difficult for people to access them, for at least people in Ukraine. Yeah, you you could make it more difficult for people in Ukraine. I'm not sure that you know uh, uh, they're necessarily the most important recipients of, of, of a lot of his uh, messages. Um, you know, a lot of his messages are, are external facing as well. You know, in order to you know encourage uh, uh, Ukrainians around the world and governments around the world, I, I think. Uh, within Ukraine, like there's very, very strong support for you know his leadership and 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 so on. I I don't think them not seeing him every night is, is going to make a huge difference to that. All right, so let's shift gears and come uh, across the Atlantic Ocean to another country that has a uh, completely dysfunctional political decision making and strategic decision making. I'm referring, of course, <laughs> to the United States, and I want to. First of all, you you know you mentioned uh, U.S. support for Ukraine in the context of of uh, so I'm going to take you on a tour of apparently disparate <laughs> policy issues, but they are in fact connected. We're going to talk about uh, U.S. support for Ukraine in the new probably Republican House, and then we're also going to talk about uh, uh, FISA 702 reauthorization which all has in common that these are things that need to happen in Congress in order for current U.S. policy across a wide range of areas to continue that I'm not sure how I understand are going to happen. So Marjorie Taylor Greene, who may or may not be, whose vote may or may not be necessary (laughs) to elect a new speaker of the House, uh, says not another dime for Ukraine. She wants to use the money to build a wall on our border. I'm curious how you think the, if there is a change in power in the House, which as we are talking seems likely but not certain, by the time people hear this, it may be certain or it may be negated. But what do you see as the prospects for continued uh, robust U.S. support for Ukraine in whatever Congress takes office on in, in January? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I, I think it, it we basically need to break it down in half because the, there's two different years uh, that this Congress is going to be in, in charge. The, there's one that's you know about to come up the, the 2023 cycle, and then it's going to be the 2024 cycle as well. I think a lot of the problems in 2023 are solved by making use of the, the lame duck session. Um, so up up until now, uh, Ukrainian or, or, or sort of uh, uh, Ukraine assistance. Uh, whether that's uh, a direct financial assistance uh, uh, to the Ukrainian government, whether it's you know uh, a loan assistance, whether it's military assistance, whether it's humanitarian assistance, 
These have tended to be through, you know, uh, relatively large ad hoc tranches of support, uh, usually with a, a big dollar number associated with them, but then that gets spent internally inside the uh, United States to, you know, as to what that actually means, you know, on the ground. Um, I think what that's likely to, to change in, in the lame duck session is that you, uh, there's going to be a push to have essentially a super fund, uh, if you will, you know, a, a, a meta appropriation at some colossal scale, which acts functionally as a trust fund that the president can dip into throughout the entire of the, the, the year that follows. Uh, for the individual tranches, uh, so that they can maintain support. So you know, it will be you know a, a, a billion dollars here, half a billion dollars there, you know, whatever. But the, uh, uh, someone in the White House or, or someone in Congress is going to uh, work out what the worst case scenario of needing to provide support is based on you know known knowns, known unknowns, whatever. Uh, they're going to sum up all of those uh, dollar amounts. They're going to you know add, add a bit of spare capacity at the end, and they're going to try and pass. Uh, some enormous dollar value super funds, probably as you know, attached to the the National Defense Appropriations Act, the NDAA, uh, during the lame duck. So you think you think it's a so it's basically treating Ukraine support like the debt limit, right? You you every few years you you have to press the the recharge button and. You know, in the case of the debt limit, it's it's a statutory limit on borrowing authority. But you 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 don't you don't do it every time you need to spend money. You do it periodically, and then this would be some gigantic appropriation that just sits there, and then the president <laughs> can dole it out. Yeah, pretty much. Um, like, but by periodic, I expect it to be annual. Uh, especially if they're going to do it through the NDAA, then it, it makes total sense for it to be an, an annual appropriation. Uh, and, and it will be something ridiculous, like, you know, uh, uh, $60 billion or $100 billion or something. And, you know, people will freak out about the number, but the, the number is, is an upper limit. Just because Congress gives you an appropriation at the $100 billion mark doesn't mean that you have to spend at the $100 billion mark. You know, uh, uh, there's a temptation, I guess, within the executive branch to, you know, spend money that you have. But uh, I, I expect that they're going to err on the large side rather than on the small side when it comes to, to, to that in particular. And just to be clear, are you? Is this your idea that you, you, what you think the lame duck Congress should do, or is this what you think the White House and the lame duck Congress are likely to do? And sh- should we name the bill the Marjorie Taylor Greene bill? <laughs> uh, so th- 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 this isn't what I, th- I think they should do. Although, although I do happen to think that they should do this as well. It's what I think they will do, because at, at some point they need to. Uh, look, look at what's going on in Ukraine. Decide, you know, uh, 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 are, are we willing to, you know, have you know month to month support for Ukraine, where you know, like it turns out that we need to be providing them with, you know, uh, however many rounds of artillery this month, but we can't afford it. We need to go to Congress, and then you're, you're sitting around trying to uh, find time on the congressional calendar and not get, you know, uh, uh, into a fight with Marjorie Taylor Greene or like, you know, whoever it is in. In Congress, in order to manage to get past the number so that you can afford the 500 million for the artillery shells. I think, you know, within the White House and within the Department of Defense, they would be horrified at that idea. And they would much prefer to have, you know, some, you know, meta appropriation that they can, you know, draw down in in much the same way that, you know, the debt ceiling is. You know, uh, uh, you, you pass these appropriations periodically, probably once every year or when it runs out of money. And, you know, that provides them with the ability to then, you know, get on with the, the serious work of, of providing support to Ukraine in, you know, military, financial and humanitarian senses. So right now, as as a admittedly uh, British student of American politics, you're aware <laughs> that we have two regular systems of crisis built into our <laughs> legislative executive Relations. I'm not talking about, you know, unusual crises like impeachments or uh, that sort of thing. I'm just talking about things that are structurally built in. One is that we have to fund the government every year. And uh, since we don't do business in an orderly way, there's always these uh, grand mega appropriation packages that if we don't pass, the government shuts down. And the second is the debt ceiling. And what you're talking about is like building in a third which is, so now every fall we'll have a government shutdown fight, 
a debt ceiling fight and a do we screw the Ukrainians fight. And I, I expect that that's, that's likely, but, uh, uh, but putting it inside the NDAA, then I, I think that that's, you know, not as much of a problem as you might think. Right. Cause the NDAA does in fact pass every year. It does in fact pass every year. And also I, I think what one of the odd things about support for Ukraine is that, you know, when you actually look around Congress, uh, there's a couple of people, you know, out on the far left and out on the far right who, who genuinely, genuinely don't support. Uh, uh, Ukraine, Marjorie Taylor Greene is, you know, uh, uh, one of them. But actually, you know, within the core of of, of both parties, actually, the, the support is pretty deep. Uh, and there's a bunch of different reasons for that. You know, there, there's uh, uh, some people that, you know, uh, want to stick it to Russia. There's a bunch of people that, you know, genuinely support Ukraine. They they, they want to support the underdog in a, a war of aggression. Uh, there's some that support Ukraine because of, you know, uh, a genuine, you know, want to support uh, for humanitarian reasons. Uh, you also have really transactional uh, views as well from from some congressmen who who realize that lots of money being spent on Ukraine means lots of money being spent in their district in in you know uh, uh, defense appropriations close to home, and that acts as a financial stimulus close to home. And if if the economy is doing well, they get more votes, right? So. Um, there's lots of people across, you know, the, the political spectrum on both the Democratic and the Republican side who do actually fundamentally support Ukraine and are very, very happy for the U.S. to continue supporting Ukraine, maybe not indefinitely, but for a long time into the future. And what that means, I think, is that while you get a lot of rhetoric, especially from Republicans that is, you know, hostile to Ukraine, uh, where they uh, say, you know, why are we why are we spending all these dollars on Ukrainians instead of instead of spending these dollars on you know American priorities like Marjorie Taylor Greene's case, I guess, building the wall and combating space lasers that you know are owned by the Rothschilds. Of course, like you know, key things that matter to people at home. What I think, you know, uh, uh, fundamentally is is that you know uh, Republicans as a bulk. You know, behind the scenes, actually, do support uh, U.S. assistance to Ukraine, um, but for rhetorical reasons like the fact that they can loudly object to it, uh, because you know the, the reasons why they support Ukraine are a, a little bit you know different to you know folks that have you know more immediate problems and, and and don't really care about what's happening you know overseas. They don't really care about you know foreign policy objectives. They you know see the the number and it sounds very large, and then they get upset that that very large number is not directed at them. You know, it's it's very easy, I think, as a, a Republican wanting to, you know, collect votes, uh, you know, especially votes built on, you know, grievance of, of party members. Um, it's very easy to say, look at this big number that's being spent on, on Ukrainians. Uh, it's not being spent on you. That's why you should vote for me and not for Joe Biden. But behind the scenes, being actually very happy that, you know, Joe Biden is, in fact, using this money to support Ukraine. And the NDAA is, is one of the, the perfect vehicles for this because, you know, as a, a Republican, you're always going to vote for the NDAA, of course. And in the event that this gets attached to the NDAA, it's a small percentage of, you know, the overall U.S. military budget anyway. And so it, it becomes one of these, these things that, you know, uh, you can loudly complain about whilst at the same point uh, implicitly supporting. All right, let's talk about one more thing, which is... Uh, back in Lawfare's old days, we used to talk a lot about FISA 702. We haven't talked a lot about FISA 702, but just because you forget about 702 doesn't mean 702 forgets about you. Congress put a uh, sunset provision into the last reauthorization, uh, which I believe was five years ago. And now uh, that sunset is sinking into the Pacific Ocean, and uh, we need to uh, reauthorize 702 unless we want to, you know, lose a whole lot of uh, intelligence, signals intelligence capability. And I look around and I say, I don't understand, you know, you always had a left-right problem on 702, between the Jim Jordans and the, you know, who don't want the FBI or the NSA to have any collection authority that could be used to spy on Republicans and traditional left civil libertarians. I don't understand anymore, uh, particularly if the House actually is in the hands of, you know, if Jim Jordan is the head of the, of the, 
uh, Judiciary Committee, how on earth are you going to pass a 702 reauthorization? It was hard enough already. It's a great question. So uh, uh, section, uh, section 702 is due to expire at the end of 2023. Uh, it's one of these time bomb provisions, which means that it needs to be reauthorized or it's going to expire entirely. And thanks to how much the intelligence community relies on this particular provision, uh, that will be catastrophic. Last time it went through a, a, a reauthorization, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll remember, Ben, uh, we had this massive car wreck. Uh, which was caused by uh, uh, Donald mis- Trump tweeting that he opposed it the morning that it was going to pass. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a car wreck. So it actually expired uh, uh, back last time. It was uh, uh, reauthorized. It expired for about a week, if I remember, which, which caused colossal, colossal problems within the intelligence community. And, and fundamentally, the reason for it is that so, uh, Section 702 is, is uh, uh, very important within the intelligence community. It's uh, uh, responsible for the collection of intelligence that's about foreigners, uh, but might have a, a nexus within uh, the United States. There, there are nuanced, you know, objections to some aspects of it, in particular when it comes to collaterally collected intelligence that relates to U.S. persons, even if it's not targeting U.S. persons, uh, that might get repurposed as part of a law enforcement investigation. Uh, against those U.S. persons later and the, the interactions between that and the Fourth Amendment. There are genuine, you know, uh, discussions about that by, you know, smart and nuanced people happening in good faith. Um, the car wreck that happened uh, back at the last uh, reauthorization had absolutely nothing to do with any of those objections. Um, and it was entirely due to, at the time, the, the discussions about Carter Page. Uh, so Carter Page was, of course, surveilled under Pfizer Title I, which has nothing at all to do with Section 702. Uh, but, you know, it was referred to in the press as Pfizer. Uh, so when Pfizer 702 stuff came up, uh, that was uh, widely misconstrued in, in the press, particularly in the right wing press, uh, as being somehow related. Uh, and so when Congress quietly passed, you know, uh, uh, essentially a flat reauthorization of, of 702 and then passed it out to the president's desk, uh, the president watches on television that, you know, uh, 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 they're trying to reauthorize this thing that surveilled his friends, uh, which of course did not happen. And so he tweets out, uh, 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 I, I'm not going to, to, to do this, functionally vetoing it. And it causes massive, massive chaos within the intelligence community. They eventually managed to repair it uh, a couple of days later uh, and get it authorized. But that, that was absolutely genuinely chaotic. So the worry is uh, how much of that chaos from, you know, back when that happened uh, is going to reemerge in a, a Republican-controlled House in, you know, at some point during the next year when this needs to be reauthorized. In the event that uh, it's not going to, then it's not particularly urgent. We, we can pass it, you know, late next year. In the event that they're going to have the same level of, you know, nonsense as, as last time, then perhaps they need to, you know, pass this in, in the lame duck session before that takes place. Well... I don't think it will be all about the Steele dossier and Carter Page this time. I do think just the level of right-wing paranoia about the deep state and the intelligence community will cause a major fracas and discontent with the idea of investing major powers in it. And I'm my concern is that the arguments that you and I would make on behalf of 702, oh, it's the single largest contributor to the president's daily brief, which from our <laughs> point of view means it's a really powerful tool when you're, you know, trying to... You might to, notice. You might notice if it goes away. <laughs> yes, you might like the, like the president might have less good information from the point of view of the civil libertarian left has always sounded like this is the really powerful spy tool that they use to go after you. And the right has adopted that in a very aggressive and conspiratorial fashion. And I just can't imagine that you're going to get a sane policy debate under these circumstances between the sincere and serious objections and concerns which I think have largely been addressed, by the way, 
and the yeah. completely insincere and and goofy concerns. Yeah, so so you, you end up with a, a spectrum of, of you know support or objection. So you get some people that have you know uh, seven hundred two is good for spying. Spying is good, therefore it is good. You have the you know uh, uh, the flip side. You know seven hundred two is good for spying. Spying is bad, therefore it's bad. Um, you do have some nuanced debate in, in the middle, you know, uh, uh, specifically around, you know, Fourth Amendment protections, around, you know, privacy protections, about how that uh, data is stored, what it means to, you know, collaterally collect on, on U.S. persons and so on. Uh, the number of people with, you know, views in that final category, you know, the people actually, you know, who have a good faith nuanced views for, you know, specific, you know, uh, 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 reforms. Twelve. Is very, very, yeah, is, is <laughs> you know, you could... You can fit all of us in a very small conference room. And, and we have, many times. And we have. We used to, back, yeah. back, back when yeah. nobody cared what 702 was. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, when it hits uh, the, the media, it, it, it tends to you know, not be those concerns that, that are driving the discussion. And you know, uh, 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 very quickly, you know, the, the you know, is it good or is it bad conversations are you know, absolutely mental and, and not helpful to anybody. So if you were the Biden administration or the uh, apolitical professionals uh, at NSA, would you push <laughs> for this to be done in the lame duck so as to, you know, a year early to avoid the, I think the technical term is shit show of trying to deal with this in the fall of 2023, the year before, in a year before an election year with uh, Jim Jordan as the head of the Judiciary Committee? Or would you roll the dice and say 2016 was a long time ago, whatever will be animating him then will not be this? So I, I think there's, there's two slightly different questions there. Like what, what, what would you do if you were, you know, you know, President Biden or, or like, you know, congressional Democrats versus what would you do if you are NSA or, or FBI? Uh, my guess is that, you know, DOJ and, and, and NSA will be, you know, screaming their lungs out at, at Congress, desperately playing with them to not roll these dice. Um, you know, uh, uh, pass it now whilst you can before any, any madness can happen. Congressional Democrats and, and, you know, President Biden might have, you know, different views as to, you know, wh wh whether or not it, it, it has good optics to pass it in, in the lame duck rather than, you know, fighting through, you know, tooth and nail next year. Um, I don't know how that's going to play out. Uh, I, I hope they have very serious people, you know, advising, like, my advice would be to pass it. Like, I don't really care about the optics, but like, to, to, to try and sort out what they need to sort out and, and get it passed in the lame duck, just because rolling the dice, you know, on, on a lot of things is dangerous, but on, on this particular thing is like, it, it causes so many problems, like, it, it's not worth it. Yeah, it's very, very hard to explain to people who do not have any familiarity with how SIGINT collection works, just how disruptive it is when you build entire programs, uh, both legally and technically, on the back of an understanding of the law and then that law disappears. Yeah, it's not even reformed a little bit. It like it just like wholesale vanishes, and NSA goes to their server rooms and turns everything off. <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's genuinely catastrophic. For you know, like but maybe they can kind of you know bootstrap some some things you know around the edges in order to make you know some of their their bits of surveillance continue to work. And there's you know other authorizations they can use for you know certain things that are happening overseas, you know, perhaps some of their, their, their particularly high collateral, you know, uh, coverage. But like, it would be like driving a, a dumpster truck through the middle of one of, you know, NSA's data centers, like it would be genuinely, genuinely disruptive. And, and one of the things that they sometimes have done in the past is they when they fear this is going to happen, they go to the court um, since the authority that expires is the authority to seek new orders. Right. So what you do is you go to the court and you get an order that'll buy you some time that'll outlast the statute. But you really don't want to put the intelligence community in that position. It's, it's also relatively controversial in its own right. It's, it's something that, you know, folks don't want to do like that, that you know, but, but, but people make these types of decisions when you're, you're looking at, you know, like, 
that this thing is is expiring for you know a day or something like maybe we can do something to try and bridge it you know in order so that we don't have to turn everything off like in the event that it's affirmatively ending in the event that congress says you know what like you know we don't need 702 anymore like nsa work it out then you know those types of uh, little games don't don't work at all and you know like you, you just you know turn everything off and, and, and hope that you can find something around the edges and, you know, the president's daily brief gets a lot thinner. On that cheerful note, uh, we are going to leave it there. We have gone from why the Ukrainian internet still exists to what's going to happen to FISA 702 a year and three months from now. Matt, Tate, there are very few people that can have that range of conversation over the course of an hour uh, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. Always a pleasure, Ben. Always a pleasure. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material Supporter at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfareblog.com. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Benjamin Wittes. Our music is performed by Sophia Yen. As always, thank you for listening.